Live from the rooftop of the Herman London Real Estate Group in beautiful downtown Maplewood, it's the St. Louis Realtor Podcast with your host, Adam Cruz. Welcome, welcome everybody to the St. Louis Realtor Podcast live from the rooftop of the Herman London Real Estate Group in beautiful downtown Maplewood, Missouri. Today is December 20th, 2016. This is actually episode 30. Glad to have you here. I'll give you a couple quick updates about Herman London Group, and then we'll jump into introducing our very, very special guests and jump into the content of the podcast today. Uh, but so just a quick, couple quick updates about the real estate group here. We've got our company bowling event coming up in February. That's always a good time. We just had our company gift exchange and kind of our ugly sweater contest. We went to Hacienda this year and we did one of those white elephant things, which works out for some people and works out poorly for other people like me. I got some used slippers this year, but, uh, that was okay. That's okay. Um, it's tough right now because we're all extremely busy. The realtors are very busy. We're doing deals and everyone's trying to make time for their families and for their Christmas shopping and all that kind of stuff. But it's just a busy time in real estate. So it's surprising that people would be buying or selling when it's so cold out, but they are. So that that's a good thing though for our business. And oh, I wanted just to, and there's an announcement coming because we were adding some people to the leadership team at Herman London pretty soon. We're kind of working out the details and the kinks of that now, but we're excited. We've been working on this and it's going to be the next step in growing our business. So that's great. But that being said, I'm going to jump into the meat of the conversation today. And we're glad to have Joe Rossi here, who's the owner of Xbility and also a speaker, a coach, a mentor. Uh, You do team building. You kind of teach on communication and personality styles. And also we have here my lovely wife, Molly Cruz. Ooh, I almost said your last your other last name. I'm so nervous today, but uh, we're glad to have both of you here. The reason why I wanted to bring you guys in is because I sort of want to talk about the mental side of life, the mental side of you know just whatever your where your work is, whether you're a realtor or um, obviously everyone's in different kinds of businesses and different types of jobs. But how to get out of your own way, and uh, you mentioned looking for the win win. So thank you for joining us. Tell me real quick, Joe, what is Xbility? Xbility is a company that um, is deemed as, I guess, personal growth or self-development. And we have a series of different courses designed to help people kind of find what they're looking for. And it can seem vague sometimes to explain it because what everyone's looking for is something different. Some people are looking for balance, some people clarity, some people peace of mind, some insight or breakthrough with relationships or finances or health. Um, And we have a way of having some exercises and processes and lectures that helps people kind of cut through to figure out, you know, who they are and what do they want and answer some of the basic questions in life. So who they are and what do they want? Those Mm -hmm. are important questions. Okay. And I met you, Joe, through, uh, one of our realtors has gone to your class Mm -hmm. and uh, my wife, Molly has gone too. That's why she's here today to kind of give her insight. But I met you because one of our realtors and I were having lunch one day and we started talking about some of this sort of deeper stuff that people don't normally talk about. Like you said, who we are and what we want. And the who we are part, I think, is particularly what came up. And she said something. And I was like, how do you know how to talk like that? <laughs> and she was like, how do you know how to talk like that? And so then she told me that she had been to your course. Mm-hmm. And eventually Molly went. And uh, it's all history now. But how did I guess I can ask, how did you kind of get into this stuff? Well, I took the courses many years ago. It kind of fell into my lap. It wasn't something I was looking for. I worked for AT&T at the time, and I was able to go and trade because the courses were held in their building. And so it, I took the first course, and that was kind of very eye-opening to me, the concept of win-win. I hadn't really, I'd read the Stephen Covey books about it, but I hadn't really seen it like live. And there's some exercises that we do. And so I just kind of I kept going and there's a core three courses and I went through all of them and then kind of landed myself in the coaching program to become a coach because I just, I saw people have breakthroughs. And when you see somebody's light bulb goes off, that's a really special moment to get to see somebody go, oh my gosh, it's not just me. It's not just me feeling this way or thinking this way or wanting something different. So um, that happened many years ago and then I became a coach. And then after a while, the owner didn't want to do it anymore he wanted to move on to his next step in life and so i was able to buy the company from him you just mentioned about people's light bulbs going off and i i think that 
that's a good way to explain. I feel like, like the couple of people that I've encouraged to go to the course or the class that it's always kick, it's always kicking and screaming it seems before they'll go <laughs> right and then afterwards they're like I would climb a mountain and pay a million dollars and literally sell my firstborn child to go to this class again and you should go and you should go and you should go and everyone should go and that's it's that's amazing to see and I guess that's probably the biggest part of the reward for you is seeing kind of the light bulb absolutely when you can see um, something land for somebody and it can be the littlest thing or the biggest thing. And what it does is it gives it gives somebody either hope or peace. And I think the resistance when people don't want to come, like you say, they come kicking and screaming, it's because change can be scary. And even if we're not um, happy or we're, we're not living to our full potential, um, there's a comfortability with complacency. Like, I know how to do this. Uh-huh. And the idea of, if it, of um, asking questions or digging too deeply can really, it can be daunting to some people. And so change can be scary. But when they see it's not so bad on the other side of it, it's actually worth it. Then that's when they get to that, like you said, the the mountain part. What is that whole change is scary thing? What's that all about? Why why is change so scary to people? Well, if we step back, I think we live in a culture right now where fear is very prominent. It's it's to fear anything that's different than what we already know, whether it's people, experiences, and so um, it's so easy to tap into to, to be afraid of things or to question it or to say. No, first. Um, and again, change is, I know how to do this. I may not be happy, but I can do this. What if it's, what if it's worse? Or what if I, you know, and I think it, equally, though, people are also afraid of, man, what if I could be ridiculously happy? What if I could have that job I want? Or I could have the communication and relationship that I want? Or I could be, you know, having the time of my life. What is that like? And people just get caught then in the, I don't want to fail. I don't want to succeed. So I'm just going to stay right here kind of thing. The the whole like afraid of success thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'm going to try to tie this a little bit into real estate here too. Mm-hmm. And, and I think I do, I see that with realtors that they know what to do, right? They come to every training class we have. They know how to show properties and how to present a listing and how to make prospecting phone calls and all that stuff. They just don't quite know why they can't get themselves to do it. Right. Yeah. Why can't I get out of bed and go to the office like I know I should, or like the goals that I set and all that kind of stuff. And so you're just saying people are, people are comfortable or they're comfortable in their uncomfortableness or something. I think that there, there's a, there's a familiarity with being, um, kind of status quo. And so it, it, it does, it gets comfortable. And I think then the belief sets in a, well, life is just hard or I can't, nobody gets everything they want or you can't have everything kind of mentality. And people buy into that either consciously or subconsciously. And so, yeah, people get stuck that way. And I was asking you earlier if you, you know, kind of relate or whatever to Anthony Robbins. Mm -hmm. And you said that, you know, if now that you know a little bit more about him because you saw that documentary, I love the documentary that was on Netflix and you found that he's not a motivational speaker and you don't associate yourself as a motivational speaker, right? Correct. So if you gave yourself a title, what what would it be? Technically, my title would be life coach. I tend to not um, buddy up to that title because, in essence, anyone can kind of deem themselves that. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, but it, but that really is what I am. Um, the reason that we that we aren't motivational speakers, it's no it's no different than what you're just saying with your real estate agents. Um, you can give them the seminars and all the tools, and here's ten steps to this. You can't make them get out of bed. You can't motivate them. They've uh-huh. got to come with that desire. And that's the same thing when people come to the courses. They can come and, and get everything out of it. Um, or they can come and just sit there. and just. So it's, I can't motivate them. I can say whatever and do whatever. But it's, it's, it's like you've, you've got to come kind of with your, with your tank charged, ready to, get, to learn something. Which is great, right? That's what the people that you actually get there, hopefully, are kind of ready to, quote, unquote, do the work. For the most part, yeah. I think a lot of times people, especially in the beginning, they don't know what they're getting into. Sometimes they're just getting there just to shut somebody up that made them, you got to do this, you got to do this. Yeah. But it, it doesn't really take too long for people to kind of go, oh, well, that makes sense. Or to have somebody else be sh- you know, sharing about something and go, oh, well, yeah, I, I feel that way too, or I've heard that before. So I think it's easy then to make a connection. And at the end of the day, whatever got them in the seat, it all comes down to relationships. And we're, we have a relationship with everything. 
And so when people can realize that there's benefits here for my relationships, and that's, that's really what people plug into. Molly, when you, came, when you went to the course for the first time, I'm guessing you probably like packed a little bag with some snacks and a water <laughs> and was like ready to go sit at a table with a nice white tablecloth and have your pen here, right? And your paper there and like get your water set up. And is that what you're sort of expecting? And um, I really didn't know what to expect. <clears throat> I sort of walked in there with just an open idea that I was ready to, you know, make some changes in my life. And I wasn't even 100% sure what direction, you know, the changes needed to come from. Um, I was definitely a nervous wreck walking in there because, you know, that's the scariest part. You're walking into sort of an unknown space and you don't really know. You may or may not know anybody there. And, you know, within a matter of hours or certainly an evening, um, the, everything shifts and it becomes much easier to sort of relax and then, you know, be able to kind of pay more of attention and, and release a little bit. Because there's sort of a veil of secrecy around it, right? Because we want they don't you don't want them to know everything that's coming. And what, what is the reason for that? Well, it, it, there is a level of secrecy, um, and it's so that people have an, an authentic experience of their own. So we talk about, it's, it's set up where it's 25% lecture, 25% processes or exercises, and then 50% sharing. But if we, t- if we gave people an agenda and said, okay, you know, at 7.15, we're going to do this, and at 9 o'clock, we're going to do this, mm-hmm. people are going to look at that on paper, and first of all, they're not going to understand what it really means. Right. Um, and so they're going to make an assumption or a judgment about it, and they're gonna, they could have their guard up. So um, we kind of address all of that the first night about why, you know, first of all, we address why we're not a cult and why we have things... <laughs> Why right? there is so much secrecy to it, and really, it's just to enhance their own experience, and so that they can have a just kind of a clean slate. Now, you mentioned that it's not a cult, correct? And you know, anyone else that I've ever talked to about, like, oh, you teach classes on, you know, time management or whatever, they've never had to give that sort of caveat. <laughs> By the way, what I teach is not a cult, right? But the only reason you even have to say that is because the people who come out of your courses are so excited and so happy and so like in love with what they've just learned. And they sort of, I I keep saying they sort of like know this new language. It's not like they know Swahili now or whatever. Right. But they know how to talk to each other, I guess, in a way that they're not used to talking to other people. Right. Does that right? And so maybe that's why, why they feel connected at least to the people that they went through with. Absolutely. And it's the same language. It's just, we have different, um, there's a different level of connection when we talk about things like intention, because there's a whole exer- several exercises and processes about setting our intention. And we talk about communication. We talk about responsibility and redefining it so that it's not this heavy guilt blame kind of word, but it's about I have an ability to respond to something. It's a more of a, I guess, a relanguaging really than a new language, but we say it's a different language. So you can not, you can meet people that weren't in your course, but have taken the courses and there's almost like an instant understanding there of, oh. just like you were saying how when you spoke to nitty you guys recognize like how do you mm-hmm. exactly how did you know about that <laughs> yeah exactly and i guess that's given us uh as husband and wife it's given us kind of an ability to communicate with each other maybe differently or more powerfully than other people who haven't gone through the course might do i mean ultimately that was that was the number one reason why i chose to take the course in the first place was you and i were getting ready to you know, start a marriage together. And, you know, it was just a way for, you know, for me to sort of work through anything that I may have had left over from, you know, my adolescence or my childhood, but then also to really, to really fully know how to be vulnerable and to be the the type of, in the type of relationship and and the wife that I was hoping to be. And I still Mm -hmm. hope to be for you. I didn't go to Xbility, unfortunately. I wasn't here yet, right? When I went through my program, Uh, it was a different group that's from out of town. So, I've learned a lot about exability and got involved with that. Um, but so you you talk about some different types of topics in exability, but you also, Joe, do some like business coaching and team building and that kind of stuff, right? Right. And so I was wondering if I can ask you to sort of share a little bit about a couple of things. Um, you know, we, we, we briefly, briefly talked before this about, for example, looking for the win-win. Mm-hmm. And what is that? So I guess if you don't mind, let's just dive right into it. What does that, what, what does that mean to you? I think what's important is, um, you know, we talk in the course about the, the structure of a game. And in a, in a football game, there's a winner and a loser. And people like, they say all the time, you know, life is like a game. But in life, we subscribe to the fact that it doesn't have to be, well, I win, so you lose. 
or I want you to win, so I'm willing to lose. It's, the, it's introducing the concept of how do we find a win-win in every situation? And it doesn't, which implies then that no one has to lose. So that takes um, the idea of compromise to a whole new level of um, my, my winning may be setting a boundary or my winning may be communicating in a way that we both feel heard and respected. So it's, it's the concept of really taking that, that in order for people to get where they need to be or what they want in any situation, whether it's a work situation um, or in a relationship, that there's a level of connection and respect that uh, someone doesn't have to walk away feeling like they lost for the other person to win. And, and sometimes people play lose-lose. Well, if I'm going to lose, then I'm going to make sure that you lose too. I think that's pretty prevalent. And in, in we all know people that operate that way or um, society, how, how systems can operate that way. And so it's, it's really opening up the idea of like, what if, what if there wasn't an idea of lose in the, in the world and we could just all find our own win-win scenarios? Well, so Joe, you mentioned the the kind of the win win and, mm-hmm. and all that stuff. I wanted to give an example of something that Molly and I did after she went through your courses, if you don't mind. Sure. I'm a a morning person, right? So I get up around six thirty or so every morning, even on the weekends, and Molly is a night person, so she stays up late at night, right? And what I found was happening would be on a Saturday morning, for example, I would wake up at six thirty in the morning and I would be kind of like laying there getting basically getting mad at Molly for not being up at 6:30 in the morning on a Saturday <laughs> like why isn't she up why aren't we going to garage sales why aren't we going to the gym why aren't we cleaning the house or why aren't we doing all this stuff and then I would just like kind of lay there and just like wonder and then I'd go out and watch TV and just be like getting mad is she going to sleep all day it's 8:30 now what is the deal here you know and so then she would wake up or I guess she would be you'd be laying there right like once you were kind of like waking up, you'd be laying there feeling guilty for sleeping because you knew that I wanted you to be up. Um, and then so you'd get up and it would be sort of like this unhappy experience in the morning, right? And so what we kind of, I don't think you taught this exact thing, but what we were able to communicate after the course was, let's talk about, you know, it's Friday night or whatever. Let's talk about the plan for tomorrow and what do we want to do? And Molly would say, you know what? I'm going to sleep until 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock or whatever. And that was great for us. That was a win-win for us because then it could be 8.30. And I'm not going, is she even going to get up? I knew that she was going to get up at 9 o'clock or whatever. And I think that that allowed you to be more comfortable while you were sleeping too, right? We sort of established what our expectations would be for the next day so so that we were clear. You know, so that you weren't sitting there. Is it going to be the next four hours? Is it going to be the next 45 minutes? What are we going to do with our day? Mm -hmm. And then that kind of gave me the, you know, the freedom to, okay, I'm going to sleep until nine, totally guilt free. Don't have to worry about it. But nine o'clock comes, it's time to get up. And then we're going to go, you know, make the most of the rest of our morning. Okay. So thank you, Joe, for that. That was a good win win for us. Sorry, I don't normally share personal stuff like that (laughs) on here, but um, that was a great win win for us. And I'm sure people can use other examples from their life. Do you want to say anything else about the win win? Well, I think that's a perfect example because previously, prior to that, it came down to just having a conversation, Mm -hmm. talking about what each of you needed. And we forget that how simple that is. Um, But before it was a lose-lose because you weren't happy and you weren't even sleeping happily or restfully because you were feeling guilty. Right. So that's a classic lose-lose example. Exactly. Um, So it's a a great example. Well, a couple other things that we we mentioned. One is... um, Getting clear about our intentions and knowing that it's all about choice. I wrote that down here. I don't even know exactly what I meant by that, but that's mm-hmm. you know something that I think you'd like to share. Sure. Um, I think, uh, especially this time of year, people kind of start their new year with resolutions, and then the whole like that guilt thing kicks in when we get off track. And the idea is, um, it comes down to our intentions. Uh, because in essence, we always get what we intend. Now, sometimes we're not clear on what the actual intention is. Cause if we think of what, well, I wanted this situation to work out or how come I'm not happy, you know, in this job or this career, but we have to stop and look at, okay, so is my intention really to be happy or is my intention to kind of go down the path of, of that, that I've always been on? Meaning like there's people that, that say they want to be happy, but in essence that they really, they're, they're happy when they're unhappy. If that makes any mm-hmm. sense we work pretty diligently in the first course about people getting people really clear on what is your actual intention. And sometimes we just have to look at the results to see what our intentions are. Um, and that kind of ties into the kind the idea of choice. 
And uh, people think all the time, well, I don't have any choice. And in actuality, we always have choice. Even when we think we don't have choice, then we immediately have choice because then we get to choose our choice. It sounds very jargony when I say it like that, but if, for people to get the idea that, you know, we get to choose to get up in the morning and go to work, hopefully to a job that people love, especially if you're a real estate agent, right? But if not, so you're choosing to live where you live or drive the car that you drive or feed your family. Those are a series of choices then that then allow you then to, to get up and go to work. And so it's shifting the mindset from I have to go to work or I have to go to my in-laws to I get to. I get to go to work so I can do all the other things, other, other choices that I made. Or I get to spend time with my in-laws because, it's, because it will make my spouse or my partner happy. So it's really a, a simple mind shift from the whole have to to get to. And that's, that's just basically a choice. Oh, okay. Have to to get to. Well, I, I'm just curious. I, I, find, I find all of this extremely interesting. So unfortunately, this would probably be a five-hour podcast if I asked you all the questions that I wanted to because I've got you here. I get to ask you lots of questions. But what is this thing about you said people are happy being unhappy? What is that all about? I've heard the term like that people like to be the doormat or whatever. Is that mm-hmm. what do you mean? What is that even all about? I think that a lot of times um, it's, it comes down to a belief system, and that's really what we address in the in the level one course is our limiting beliefs, and the limiting belief that there's only so much happiness. You know, it, it feeds into the scarcity mindset, or thinking that you know, growing up, you didn't see necessarily your parents happy. Or you saw them struggling. And so we buy into these beliefs then that that's what life is. Life is hard. Or oh. people don't get what you want. And it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy then to kind of be content again or be happy with knowing that that things are always, um, you're not getting what you want. So it's a, it's a very double-edged sword. Um, but there's a lot of people that I think that kind of subscribe to that way of thinking of, well, that you know, I, something you know things just don't work out and so that their their value then comes from complaining about it or being that person that always kind of you know it's like the pig pen uh, cartoon from charlie brown that kind of walks around in the cloud of um, messiness and chaos and unhappiness but there's there's a payoff to that and the payoff is i get to feel i feel get to feel good about how crappy that i feel Okay. So that, that is definitely something that I see, right? I see people that remind me of two things. A, the person who says, you know, they see someone being successful and they go, it takes money to make money, right? And then they're just like, I guess, sort of reveling in their their financial struggles or whatever because they're now they're comfortable with the fact that they're make, not making money because they don't have any money so they don't feel guilty about not making... I don't know what that one's all right. about. But then I've also seen people who I think they came from a background where their parents, like like you mentioned, maybe they didn't have very much money. Mm-hmm. And so I'm worried that that's what some, probably just people in general, you know, I was going to say realtors or business people or whatever, but I'm worried that people do that. If they didn't come from a family that had a lot of money, then they don't really know what that would mean to actually make a decent amount of money. Mm-hmm. And so uh, is that what kind of what we were talking about before where they're like, they're f- afraid of their own success or something. Right. I, and I think there's so many things we, we being human beings from a very young age, we start to, we, what we call wire things together. We see how our parents operate and we, we start to learn very, very young. I mean, social science, there's some discrepancies. It's somewhere between three and seven is where our personalities are formed. And that's when our belief systems are formed. And so we, we learn early on, what does family mean? What does money mean? What does, you know, um, working mean? What do communication mean? And then we take that mindset of a five-year-old and we go out into the world and then we're still believing that that's what it needs to look at when we're 25 or 45. Mm -hmm. And we're wondering why our life isn't working when we're basing our beliefs off of what that five-year-old saw in whatever environment they had. Um, so that's what we do is we give people an opportunity to kind of dump the puzzle pieces out and look at it and go, okay, does this even really fit anymore? Um, and I don't have to subscribe to, wow, it has to be hard to be successful or, um, that's out there. Like I can, I can figure this out for me and have success in whatever area that I want that in and actuality in all areas. I love this. So you, you can help people. Can I say the word change? You can help people change their mindsets. I mean, I'd like to think that we do. Um, and again, we look, we focus on the limiting beliefs. I mean, my job isn't to challenge anyone's morals or values, but it's those limiting beliefs. And the limiting beliefs are that little voice in your head that says, 
well, that was dumb, or you can't do that, or you'll never have this, or that little nagging thing, the little voice that just kind of picks away at everything that you, we work to really spend our time not listening to, but seems to be, it gets really loud when it gets the best of us. Okay. Um, and so that's what we'd like to change is that, that limiting perspective. So pretty much we're kind of like all carrying around baggage from when we were four or five or whatever. And we don't even know it. Absolutely. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, another example, I'll share another example about myself if you don't mind. But, you know, people, I think that I came from what you might consider to be like a nearly perfect family, right? And I don't have any examples of my parents fighting. I, in my mind, I cannot picture a time in my life where I ever even saw my parents fight one single time. And that would seem like, oh my gosh, perfect. That's what's great, right? But, and it is great. I'm not saying it's not great, but what it did for me is I never learned that you can have love and conflict at the same time. And so when I would have relationships with people and they would be mad at me, I just automatically assumed that that was the end of our relationship or our friendship or our whatever. And that was it. We just never, we're just, we're just done and over with. And so I had to go, like, A, going through these courses helped me understand that about myself and kind of helped me to learn that there is a different perspective, I suppose, mm-hmm. right? And it's funny, right? Because, like, what a, what a, oh, I'm so sorry, Adam, what a problem to have. But everybody's carrying some stuff around. Absolutely. And that, and, but that, don't invalidate that because, in an essence, it, it may not have been as detrimental to you growing up. Mm-hmm. But still, it was something that as an adult, it's like, wait a minute, you had to rewire that thinking and you had to realize, you know, that's a huge um, aha to have like, well, I can, we can have conflict, we can have disagreement and that person's still going to be there. So that's a, that's a major lesson to learn. Right. And it's nice to be able to put words around it mm-hmm. so that I can communicate it with Molly. And if I, you know, if I leave the milk out and she gets mad because I didn't put it back in the fridge. I know now that I don't have to go and look for a new place to live. Mm-hmm. And that's literally, mm-hmm. that sounds extreme, but that's literally how my mind would think. Sure. Like, all right, that's it. I guess that's, it's over, huh? Didn't put the milk away. You're mad at me. Well, it's been good knowing you. And so that it's, that might sound stupid, but that's kind of how my mind it, was. It doesn't at all. And, but in the thing is, is it's, it's not stupid. And I'll tell you this, hopefully short, quick story. The analogy that I use is a little boy who goes out, he's playing with his, Legos or whatever, um, like four or five years old, perfectly happy in his living room. It is a beautiful day outside, and his mom sends him outside to go outside and play, get some fresh air. You know, it's a nice day. So he goes out there, and the 10 year old kid down the street kind of comes up to him, pushes him down. It's like, oh, you're a jerk. And so now he's sitting in his, you know, front yard, and he's hurting because the kid pushed him down. And he starts to think, wow, he was like five minutes ago, I was okay, I was happy inside my house, and now I'm out here. So he starts to wire together that you can get hurt out here. And now he thinks he's a jerk because the older kid told him that. Told him that. So he's got to believe it. And who sent him out there? His mom. Well, if his mom sent him out there to get hurt, then his mom must not love him. Uh, now, keep in mind, this is the mind of a four-year-old, so mm-hmm. you know, not a mature brain yet. But what happens then is that that starts to get wired, and then we, we look for ways to reinforce that. Now, was that his mom's intention? Absolutely not. But he fast forward 10 years, and so here he is 14, like a high school dance, probably not the most confident little boy, right? Because he has, has this belief, um, a, an, a false belief that he's unlovable, and he must be a jerk. And so you just imagine then how that perpetuates this one insignificant incident but completely change the trajectory of his, of his life. And we all have those one little moment when something happens or we, and, and we take our little brain and then we wire it and then we believe it when we're adults. And, we, and then we spend our life trying to figure out how come it is that this doesn't work out or how come this is harder for me. It's heartbreaking sometimes to see how people kind of sit there and, and how harshly we all judge ourselves. And at the end of the day, we have room full of people time and time and it's very different walks of life. And it, Again, the, the people that that come to our courses are their lives are working. They have successes, you know. They have relationships. They have careers. They own businesses, and they. But there's just seems to be something, and to put a group of people together and to realize that at the end of the day, every person is looking for the exact same thing. Um, we're all looking for love and acceptance, and we're all looking to avoid pain and isolation. And when you can plug into that, like, wow, that's what we all want, then we realize that we're not all that different. And then it becomes so much easier then to, to make those connections. 
Let me just take a quick moment to to uh, tell people how they can find you. Right, they would go to is it x dash b i l i t y dot com? Yes. Xbility. Xbility. And do you want to give like your Twitter or your email or anything like that? Um, well, yeah, you can find us on Twitter, um, but we're on Facebook as well at same x dash ability, or my email that you can, you can reach us at info at x dash ability dot com. Okay. Now you just said something a second ago. Sorry to jump in with the commercial there, but I, I know people are like, "Wait, this is all sounding good. I want to sign up." Right? So you mentioned that the boy then looks for ways to reinforce that belief, mm-hmm. right? And I, I think that's a really interesting concept. Um, you would probably define it, or maybe give. Can you maybe give another example of ways that we sort of everyone everyone does that in their life, right? They're right. looking for ways to reinforce their beliefs. And even if they're wrong, they're, it's like you're always gonna, you're kind of always gonna find proof if you want to find proof, right? Absolutely. We, like if I think I'm ugly, I'll remember that that kid in sixth grade who was the jerk called me ugly or something mm-hmm. like that. Right. Maybe that's a bad example. I'll let the expert talk. Right. <laughs> so that that boy again, if we fast forward to when he's in high school, um, you know, and there's a girl that he wants maybe to ask out. Um, he's going to go up to her and he's going to say something like, and he'll probably kind of stumble as he walks up to her and say something like, you want, don't want to dance with me, do you? Uh-huh. So that, again, he's he's ensuring that she doesn't want to, but you can't really say yes, don't answer a, a question like that. No, I don't want to dance with you. And that reinforces his, yep. She didn't want to dance with me. I'm unlovable, I'm a jerk. Um, well, one of the other things that you mentioned that you talk about at Xbility and then also at some of the team building and corporate training and that kind of stuff that you do is how not to take things personally. Ah, uh, yes. So um, that's like, is that a 90-week course or <laughs> 40, 40 hours a week or how does that go? I do think that it's something that when we learn it, we, we get to choose every day to remember it. Uh-huh. Um, there's a great book written by Don Miguel Ruiz and that is one of the four, it's called The Four Agreements and that's one of them is take nothing personally. And that is, um, and you, you, when you've mastered that, and, or you are on a path of doing that more, more likely than not, um, that's a mature person, mature mentally, mature emotionally, because um, it's so easy to do. I mean, especially in a relationship, it's like, oh, he's breathing heavy, or oh, she looked away. What does that mean? In a work environment, I mean, we spend you know eight plus hours a day with people in our offices usually more than our significant others. So it's easy to take little things and take it personally. But to realize at the end of the day, like, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to handle my stuff. I'm going to take responsibility for what I do and what I say. And then I'm going to let somebody else handle their stuff and let them take responsibility for theirs. It can be challenging. This is arguably one of the most liberating lessons that I took out of all, you know, all three levels of expelity. And it has been, I mean, it's something that obviously it continue, you have to practice Mm -hmm. and, You'll slip up occasionally, but but you notice it much you know much more. Um, it is it is definitely one of my favorites. It has been life changing to sort of get that that opportunity to shift the way you think about how people perceive you and 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 taking it personally or you know or not. Right. So Joe gave you some tools about how not to take things personally mm-hmm. in the courses. Okay. Is that related to we we talked in mind a little bit about like giving people your power? Yes. Is that it's sort of like. When I, if I get mad at you, then that's me basically you giving me the power. I forget the kind of exactly the wording about that, but. Well, if you get mad at me, uh-huh. then you're giving me, um, giving me your power. Cause then uh-huh. I have whatever I do then dictates how you feel. Uh huh. And that's, it's, we call it like the B12 button. So like now it's like an, in a jukebox that you press, press the B12 button and then you do that dance. So then I've got your anger button right there. Okay. And I, that's a very powerful position for me. You know, I can be, take the high road and be like, no, Adam, let's have a conversation about this. Uh Or I can keep pressing that button to see like, oh, let me see if I can keep him angry or let's see, you know, if I get, what else I can do. And it's a, it's a dangerous tool, but that's absolutely one of the things that we can realize that anger is giving our power to someone else. And that's, that can be a tough pill to swallow because people want to think I'm angry. They're wrong. I'm not giving them my power. It's kind of like they're the, they're pulling the strings and you're right. the puppet. That I love that concept too. I mean, I and I'm I don't mean to just keep saying I love everything, but <laughs> I think that 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 idea of that is really interesting to me because that's exactly right. Somebody flicks you off on the road or whatever, and then it ruins your day. Mm-hmm. You just gave how much how much like energy and power did you just give that person? Right. I mean, in that particular case, they might not even know that they had it. 
so many things can happen to people because they take things personally. Absolutely. I mean, it's anxiety, it's depression, it's, um, it's addictions. It's so many things because you spend your time frustrated then because then you're the feeling of being powerless. And that's, that is a, um, daunting, scary, huge feeling. What we do with that, we being again, human beings is a plethora of things. We can lash out, we can fall victim. We can, you know, sit in a corner and never leave our homes. We can act out. And you forget then that we're all looking for the same thing. We think, oh, you're, you're happy living your life. And here I am miserable living mine. So it's a scary thing. So I've had situations before where I'm like feeling pretty good about myself and the company's doing good and we've got a bunch of agents and all this stuff. And then I'll either read an article or I'll, I, I was at this uh, event a few weeks ago and this other guy who owns a competing real estate brokerage stood up and he's like, yeah, and we're growing and we've got a new office in Chicago and all this stuff. And I guess it, I basically gave him my power at that point because all of a sudden in, internally I was feeling really small mm. and I was like, I'm just going to shut this company down. And, you know, I didn't obviously didn't do that, but that must have been an example of me just giving this guy the power. And is there anything I could have done in that moment to, to not feel that way? Well, I think it's an initial reaction, but to notice it, we talk a lot about not being aware of it. So the moment that you notice it and go, Oh, and then, I mean, the, the enlightened, and that's one of those woo woo words, but the high road there is to be like, wow, that's great for him. Now, how do I, is that what I want for my company? And then how do I figure out how that works too? Uh And that's the win win, not to want to what, not to want what he has, but to go, wow, that is awesome for him. I hope he goes and, and thrives and does great. And I want that for me and our company too. Yeah. And so that's the, that's the idea of, it doesn't mean either one of you has to not have it, but the idea that there's enough business out there for everybody to thrive. Yeah. And he wasn't necessarily doing something that I wanted to do, but uh, that's okay. That's a good example. You and I both love talking about the personality styles, (laughs) right? And you can, you're, you can probably meet someone. How long does it take you from, if you're just like meeting someone for the first time before you know which of the personality styles they are. Well, this is a wicked game that sometimes I play with my friends when we meet people um, or just see them out. It doesn't take very long because the, the primary one that we fall to is, um, is someone ask oriented or tell oriented. And you can find out right away if someone's quieter or, you know, more vocal, but people will pretty much give you everything that you need. If you're just willing to stop and look and notice. Well, for, for sales and on real estate, mm-hmm. I like the uh, understanding the different personality styles because it helps me to know how to approach someone, right? So if they come in, do I make small talk or do I just jump right into it? Mm-hmm. Or if, you know, do I bring uh, data and charts uh, and graphs showing, you know, the sales in the area or do I bring pictures of me and my past clients shaking hands and with big smiles on our face, right? And so I would love to know and I think any anybody who is in sales or wants to be a better communicator should learn about these personality styles. It, and so I guess I'm just assuming, but is that something you go over in your courses? We do. We have, um, and it's one of the things that I've done at every pretty much team building and corporate training we've done as well, because the, if we subscribe to the, the theory that there are four primary and there, you can get way more detailed in, in, in um, more finite with it, but ours are pretty broad and there's the analyzing, the supporting, the controlling and the promoting. And when you can realize that how you operate is only about 25% of how the world operates. So that means 75% of the people are operating differently than you do your primary personality. So there's some advantage then to realizing, well, then how do I communicate with someone from a different quadrant? Um, because some people are the bottom line. Just give me the facts. Some people like give me all the facts and want all the data. Some people just want the, the, the higher energy and they're the, the innovators and the, the, um, they kind of like bounce from project to project. And then they're the people that are the, the more heart of the team that just re- are really more people oriented than mm-hmm. facts or figures, things like that. And when you can realize how people operate and realize, all right, so this is what my personality is and how do I then communicate with somebody who's different from me so that we both have an understanding and we can, we can move quicker to whatever the end goal is. So let me guess, you are the, what, what are the four again? Uh, controlling, analyzing, supporting, and promoting. So you're some sort of mix between supporting and promoting. Is that right? No? 
I supporting is my primary. Um, promoting is probably my least. Oh, really? Um, I just assume it's because you're speaking all the time. So, but that's you have to step out of your comfort zone to do that. Absolutely. I mean, I was the kid in school that every report card said, you know, Joe never speaks up. She never raises her hand. Okay. Um, but as a coach, as the person in the front of the room, that's going to make for a really boring long weekend if I'm yeah. not willing to jump out there. Um, and the idea is to realize that there, we, we all have all four. Right. And when do I need to be? you know, the analyzing one, when do I need to have the data and all my facts? And when do I need to be the, this, the promoting one of like, Oh, let's get this, let's get this started. And when do I need to be the more controlling side? Like, okay, so what's the bottom line here? Mm -hmm. We all have the ability to step in and out of each quadrant. And that's really, uh, I think when we find this elusive thing of balance that people talk about is to know, like, when do I need to be, you know, my strongest self in, in, in this situation, whether this work environment or in this, this party or this, whatever, um, and have the ability to, to, to be able to switch, but I still, you still always have your primary. And I guess that's where this whole concept of like opposites attract comes into play. Right. And yep. so if you, if you're on, I'm just picturing myself on a, a road trip with a bunch of the analyzers. Is that the, I call it analyzers. Is that right? Yes. The detail oriented person, right? right? That road trip, they're going to be on time. They're going to see every single thing that they want to see and they're going to, they're going to do it in the right order, right? And they're going to always have gas in the tank and all that stuff. Yep. But they might not end up getting into any like wild or fresh experiences or something like that, right? They're not going to deviate from the plan. They're not going to deviate from the mm-hmm. plan. But then if someone like me comes along or my buddy Noah, who we're just a little bit more fly by the seat of our pants, you know, they might be there to make sure that we sort of follow the agenda. But we're going to throw in a little bit of color, right? And be like, look at this crazy person we just met or like let's let's stop at the world's largest rocking chair or whatever right <laughs> and like get that great picture that now we all use or and something like that so the that's i guess that's where opposites attract come in do, but molly do you know what your personality was i think i think you pegged me as con- as a controller I think so. And I was really sh- surprised by that because I find myself to be a very passive kind of go with the flow person and the definition of controlling to me I think was different than what it what it really is. So I was like, I, are you, am I in the right spot? Um but you tell people how it is. I I suppose I tell people how it is, but I also like to be sort of in control like for example, coming here today, you know, it was I was what's the itinerary? What are we talking about? I need uh-huh. to prepare for this. What's happening? Um I like to be in the know and prepared for stuff, I guess. And I think mm-hmm. that that's really more why you put me in that particular spot. There's, um, you know, there's the opportunity to get a little bit deeper in it and some other things that you can do, some other exercises. And it turns out that I'm, I'm pretty close to a little bit of all of them. I don't mm-hmm. fall just really far on one end of the spectrum, but I'm relatively in the middle of, of sort of all of it. But It's really good to be able to uh, understand your own personality style understand your coworkers' personality styles, mm-hmm. understand your spouse's personality style or your partner's personality style, right? So uh, we have a guy that works here, Tom, who he's the opposite of me also. He's the analytical type. And if I had never taken this personality assessment stuff, I would literally think that Tom hates me. Yeah. Because I say to Tom, I'm like, Tom, I got this great new idea. Let's change the way we do something. And what do you think he says? No. <laughs> it's always a no Absolutely not, right? And so I've had to learn that he's always going to say no at first. Mm -hmm. And so then I need to present him with the details, and then I need to give him some time to think about it, and then I need to talk to him about it again, and maybe it'll become a yes. But we took these these kind of assessments Mm -hmm. together, and uh, he's in a key role at our company, and that's that's why we did that. And uh, it's been great for us because I understand that he doesn't hate my guts, and just think I'm just this idiot with all these stupid <laughs> ideas. But also I think it's helped him understand my value too because I'm not everything's black and white kind of person. And But he he's learned that, oh, I guess we do need someone who comes up with some zany ideas every once in a while, you know, if we want to grow this business. So Absolutely. Hope, hopefully people can come to the class and learn more about themselves. And uh, do Do people bring their spouses to the class a lot? Um, we get this question a lot and we've had people do it 
every which way where people come together with their with their spouse or their partner um, we've had one go through and then another one go through and they ask what's the best way and it really is completely subjective it depends on the individual couple some couples have gone through all the courses together and loved every minute of it some have gone through all of them separately and loved it um it sometimes they need some, it, it kind of depends on how the relationship is too. The idea is when, if you really want to get some work done is to come together. If you need, need to kind of figure out, okay, so who am I first before I can figure out who we are, then maybe there's some benefit in doing it separately. The idea though is for people just to realize that there doesn't have to be anything wrong or your relationship in, you know, in dire straits to realize there's always a level of communication that we can achieve a next level of it of the communication we can achieve yeah there's just something to having giving yourself a weekend where you can just kind of find the you know put the answer some questions for yourself or figure out what is it that i really want and and actually then realize that we're all okay even with our own idiosyncrasies and limiting beliefs and all that stuff who we are is still okay if we can stop judging that and, and listening to that little voice and figure out like, wow, I want more and I can, I can have it. And it's really within my own power to do that. That kind of reminds me, you also teach a couple other courses, just there's X ability, which is three levels, right? Correct. And then you have an upcoming class called the mindful woman. We do every year in January, we have a, a course called the clean, a clean slate, which kind of jump starts the year. Um, is and- that for anybody or only people who've been to X ability or? In the past, it's been for only people who have taken the level one. The, okay. uh, that's a prerequisite. At least level one. Right. Each year, it's had a theme. And this year, as I was thinking about what's our theme going to be for next year, I realized that the majority of our population, about 70% of the people that take our courses are women. And so what if we designed our clean slate course to be the mindful woman? And it kind of grew then into being a, a whole theme for the whole year with um, – many courses throughout the year having you know mindful relationships and mind a mindful home and keeping that mindset about it so the idea is to jump start the year with um and so this course is, is open to anyone there are no prerequisites however it's for it's a woman's course so it's open to any woman i guess i should okay. say mm-hmm. i was gonna um, say where do i sign up <laughs> yeah and we've had some pushback with some some guys which i love so that there may be a, a mindful guy course down the, down the road but, um, well, you can't come to that. I know. So I will get my partner in crime, I guess, to leave that course. Um, <laughs> but the idea of the mindful woman is I think that, and again, not to, not to, um, discount the men, but again, a majority of our grad base are women. So I'm, I'm catering to them in this fact, but so busy and so stretched out. And yet there's all this data out there about, you know, breathing and relaxation and positive thinking and all this, and, you know, Uh, being mindful and emotional intelligence. And we have all this data and sometimes we just don't know what to do with it because we're still, you know, driving to work and having a job and having kids and paying bills and doing laundry. It's hard to kind of figure out all of that. So I, my idea was just to have a weekend where women can come together and just kind of breathe and go, okay, so what is it that I really want? And, and how do I take my relationships to the next level? And how do I find my next, um, career goal or how do I find what is my purpose or my passion and it's designed very differently than our other courses our other courses are designed with a lot of exercises and prompts to kind of to push you outside the box because that's that's outside the comfort zone and yeah. that's hopefully why you came is to to get something that is outside your box but this one is really about um connection and calming and um very healing very a loving nurturing space so the, I mean, the the main courses are ability, and it's not like people should feel uncomfortable that there's members of the opposite sex in the course, right? But this this particular class will just kind of give them this extra level of safe space or something, right? And in in the regular courses, I love it when um, there's men in the course because I think a lot of times we women can uh, make assumptions about guys and, and be very dismissive to all guys do this or don't do this. Uh-huh. And so to have a, a man on the course to say, wait a minute, no, I have, I care very deeply about that. And I want my communication or my, my, my relationships to be better. Um, we really need that man's voice in the courses. They're just not an equal 50, 50. It's about a 70, 30 split. Right. And well, we got to fix that. Right. right. Yes. But so, but the mindful woman was, was geared specifically towards what we, what I hear all year round is, is women, especially that have taken all the courses that want to know what's the next step. And, um, 
And so this is, we're going to try it out. So this is what we're going to try this year. And the other courses are still available throughout the year. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The the regular ability for the guys and stuff. Absolutely. Well, I have a million more questions for you, but I guess we (laughs) kind of have to wrap it up. You know, our listeners are used to our podcast being under an hour, and I think we're getting really close to that now. I want to mention again, x-ability.com. Right. Or facebook.com slash x-ability. Right. Um, do you mind if I say that anyone who contacts you and mentions this podcast, I will personally pay $50 towards their course? Go right ahead. And we, anyone who mentions this uh, podcast, we also will take $50 off the course. Ooh, I like it. So, so I'm matching that. You are. Cool. Okay. Do you have anything else you want to say before I jump into my five questions that I ask every guest? No, the only other thing I would say would be the Mindful Woman has its own website, and that oh, is mindfulwomansdl.com. Mindfulwomansdl.com. And that is, um, it's a really beautiful website, which pretty much explains the course way better than I seem to be able to do most of the time. So, I always, I always want more people to go to the courses, you know? And so in my mind, I've designed all these different like Facebook ads or like basically ad campaigns for you guys. And uh, it's... <laughs> It goes from, you know, get those skeletons out of your closet, <laughs> right? And come to this class to like something more subtle, like looking to make a positive impact, you know, come to come to this course or whatever. I try to encourage people to go to this. And I mentioned this earlier that it's always really hard to get people to go, at least for me. And maybe my approach is wrong, but they always are really happy that they go. Uh, that they went once they go right Mm -hmm. and so we had some people that are some friends of ours just went to level one recently kicking and screaming you know uh, but now they're like they'll be kicking and screaming to get into level two they'll Mm -hmm. be fighting to get in there but if anyone's listening and they're thinking should i go or they're probably thinking i know someone who should go right Mm -hmm. Get those people to go. Sign them up. I mean, you. Ha- I think you even have like a guarantee or something like that. We you? do. It's a money back guarantee. You have to complete the entire course. Okay. Um, and then within, I think it's seven days, just write a letter that you didn't get anything out of it that you would wanted to get out of it. And I think in the 17 years that I've been doing this, the, the person that owned the company prior to me, it was a less than 1% of anyone who's ever asked for their money back and it hasn't has, it hasn't happened since we've been owned the company. So, but that's part of the incentive. And I think what's, we love your enthusiasm of trying to get people in the seats mm-hmm. and really it's, it's, if we think about it, so it's something that we need and then it becomes one of those, Oh, I don't need that kind of thing, but it's something to do for yourself. Yeah. It's do just, it for yourself yeah. or give it as a gift for somebody. Yeah. Maybe, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not something you need. It's something you deserve. Uh, Ooh, I like that. I like well that. put, Molly. Hello. <laughs> uh, it's it's like it would be. It's I, I'll I'll stop. I guess it's it's just hard to get people to go, but they always really really love it when they go. And it would be easier to get them to go if it was like, come to this class to learn about how to change your spouse. Right? It's yeah. like no, yes. this is good for you. Okay, I'll, I've said enough. Unless you have anything else you want to say about that. No. Okay, so we have two guests today, so I'm going to ask each of you our, our five questions that we ask every guest, and I'll start with you, Joe. Okay. And uh, so who lives under your roof? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, five little bit more personal questions. Um, so I live with my um, partner, Kevin, and um, my 87-year-old blind mother lives with us as well, and, and a puppy. I was going to say, and you have some yes. puppies, right? Okay, and where are you your best? Ooh, um, without a doubt, in the course room. Okay, good. And do you have a favorite blog or podcast or book? Oh, many. Or many. one of each, or a yes. um, couple, or whatever. Um, I gotta say that the podcast, I I bounce around a lot, and I go from one to the other, so I I can't think of a favorite, but um. Uh, book there are so many um, anything pretty much by Brene Brown I think is um, how do I spell that Brene Brene it's B-R-E-N-E Brown. B-R-E-N-E Brown mm-hmm. okay she's a she has a PhD in social work and she has a way of relating people to people and and it feels like she's writing just to me when you're reading her or she has many TED talks as well so you can find her anywhere oh, cool. um but anything, her books, the Don Miguel Ruiz books, um, it, for couples, anything by Gary Chapman. He's written the um, Five Love Languages, which I think helps couples oh. communicate so much 
um, better. <laughs> yeah, we even, love the love, yeah. love languages. That that's a game changer. So, and it works with kids. It can work. It works with anybody really, but really with couples and kids. Okay, and what is your guilty pleasure? Oh, guilty pleasure. Um, probably reality TV. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I feel guilty even saying it. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, then it's then it's guilty enough. Yeah. Um, and who is your mentor, and how have you thanked them? Oh, um, I've had a couple. Um, the one that comes to mind, I I thank him when I refer to him as Yoda because that's kind of who he's been for me. Um, we've had a really he's he did this work long before I did. He taught me the most about um, trusting myself, okay, and how to how to understand and read people, and just really when I can just shut up and just listen and observe that that that's everything I need. Um, I probably should thank him. It's been a while. We've um, life's gotten kind of busy for he and I, and our paths aren't as as connected as they once were. But um, he really uh, fine tuned my BS meter and my people reader. My BS meter. Can I buy one of those at Home Depot? Or I don't know. Maybe, but you got to really work on it. Okay. Okay. And so you maybe you will take this opportunity to thank them yeah. after, after this show. Okay. And Miss Molly, who lives under your roof? Uh, my handsome husband Adam Cruz and our dog Maya. Uh, I guess they don't technically live under our roof. Oh, and we have three chickens who live slightly outside of our roof. Under their own roof. <laughs> Under their own roof. And where are you your best? Um, I would say I'm probably at my best when I have a like group of close friends or family that we're sort of hosting like a dinner party or just like a, an intimate little gathering, I think. Okay. Do you have a favorite blog or podcast or I'm adding book to this question? Um, I really enjoy Joe Rogan's podcast. It's not quite as... Um, like self, not self help or anything like that, but it's uh-huh. not quite as uh, maybe intellectual <laughs> as what was mentioned before. But I really like Joe Rogan. He's super entertaining. Um, I don't know. My favorite book, I mean, without being a little bit cheesy, The Four Agreements was a pretty good one. And I actually, without knowing that we were going to be talking about that day, just posted something on my Facebook about mm-hmm. it. So that's sort of one that was, that was pretty big for me. What is your guilty pleasure? Uh, similar to Joe, I would say the Real Housewives. Real Housewives. Yeah. Which one? All of them. All of them. Any of them? <laughs> any, any, any and all load of them. them up. Bravo TV. York. I don't like New York. Okay. And who is your mentor, and how have you thanked them? Um. Well, personally, again, without being cheesy, it would have to be Joe. She's, you know, she's, she was uh, my coach for for all three levels, and has become a very good friend of mine throughout that, and um, just a lot, a lot to learn personally. Um, professionally, I would have to say uh, my boss, Zach, well, my old boss, Zach Hickert, I worked for him when I was a footwear designer, and he was, by and large, probably the one who taught me the most. And how have you thanked both of them? Uh, I don't know. I think, I mean, I don't know how much I come out and just say it to Joe, but I think the fact that we've been cultivating a relationship, um, you know, I've only since met you, I guess, in in January, so almost a year now, and it seems like I've known you a lot longer. But I think, I hope that that's one way to thank you. And then, um, I guess I just did also. Mm-hmm. For my old boss, Zach, I haven't really talked to him in a while. We sort of grew apart. We don't, you know, work at the same company together anymore. Um, did I just you dress reached up out as to him for Halloween one time? No, that was a different one. Oh, okay. No, Not him. Um, I did. We just spoke right before the wedding, though. So, so we, sort of, you know, got to have a little ushy-gushy moment. Um, and we're hoping to get together sooner than later. But I should probably work on that. Okay, so... If you are looking for some personal growth, x ability dot com. If you're looking for some some coaching for yourself or your business, or if you want someone to come and speak to your company, and you can kind of like, if you want some custom tailored speaking or solutions for your company, info at x ability dot com. Right. Um, and if you have any questions for our podcast, just email podcast at hermanlondon dot com. And we look forward to hearing from you and any future topics. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great day and take care.